Welcome from St. James Presbyterian Church. We are so glad that you are here with us today. My name is Eric Daly. I am the pastor here at St. James Presbyterian, and I'm so glad to be the pastor here. This is a great place to be. Our hope in creating our online worship videos is that this will be a time to be in God's presence, to hear something new, to be near God, to grow, to develop, all those things that we do here at church. Today you'll hear some musical pieces from our fantastic music team. Feel free to sing along or just take it all in. There will also be a time for scripture, a time for reflection and preaching, and a time for prayer. I hope God speaks something amazing to you today. It is good for us to be here. Today we're going to look at the book of 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. Let's take a look at the word of God here today. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. Paul says, I'm grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly and in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. 
The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason, I received mercy. So then in me, as the foremost, uh, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. A number of years ago, I attended a conference in England, and I got to tour the British Museum. It is an amazing place, and I encourage everyone to visit if you haven't already. It is so cool if you ever get over to London. Now, the museum houses all the antiquities and artifacts the British archaeologists and explorers and scholars have acquired over literally centuries. And they are meticulously studied and categorized. I saw busts of Roman emperors and I saw the Rosetta Stone. I saw medieval communion ware. How cool to think that our medieval brothers and sisters in Christ celebrated communion with it. And all of this is to the benefit of scholarship. We know so much more about the world and its history because of the work of scholars who have contributed to that museum. But there was a moment while I was there and I was looking at the mummies. That's right, they have a bunch of mummies, tons of Egyptian mummies. And I'll tell you, they are even scarier in person than they are in any movie. And it was the busiest room in all the museum. People swarmed around these mummies. But while looking at them, I started to think, well, why are these here in England? Why aren't these in Egypt, where they came from? Why are they in a British museum instead of an Egyptian museum? So I went up and I asked a person working there and quite glib glibly said, if the, asked, or if, if the Egyptians knew that their stuff was here. And he just kind of laughed and said, oh, what a funny thought. But as I was asking, an Egyptian woman walked by and said, oh, they know that they're here, and the Egyptians have asked for them back many times. Turns out that there is a decades-old controversy about who should have a country's antiquities. You see, not too long ago, the British were the greatest imperial power in the history of the world, surpassing the Greeks and the Romans and even the Mongols and even Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. And that meant they could go into a country and just take whatever they wanted. Now, granted, this was often for scholarly reasons, but it was taking nonetheless. And we are indebted to this scholarship and how it has taught us about the history of, wor of the world, but it came at a cost particularly to the lands where items were taken from. I mean, shouldn't the Egyptians have control over Egyptian antiquities from their lands? Can you imagine the harm that would be done if another country came into the United States and took the Declaration of Independence? The point I want to make here is that even when we're reaching for virtuous goals like learning and scholarship, we can often do harm. Even when we want to do good, we can often do bad. Those British, British archaeologists brought knowledge to the world while also supporting imperialism and stealing from other countries. Now, in theology, we have a word for this, what we call total depravity. All of our actions, even our best actions, are tainted with sin. Even when we are at our best, we are still sinners. But there's some good news, too. Look at what Paul is saying here uh, in 1 Timothy. If you remember, Paul was a jerk in his zeal for the law and the traditions of the Jewish people. He persecuted Christians. Out of all of his inflexible love for his traditions, he ended up doing a great deal of harm. Paul was an enemy to the Christian faith, and yet God called him into discipleship and service. Verse 12 again, I'm grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, Paul says, who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. 
but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Jesus Christ. Look closely at what Paul is saying. He isn't saying that he started out bad and decided on his own to change his way and then God accepted him. No, God chose and accepted him while he was a sinner. Paul only changed because of God. Look what else he says. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance. Verse 15, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason, I received mercy so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. Okay, this is probably one of the most important points in all the Bible. Jesus Christ saves sinners. That's who Jesus Christ saved. Jesus Christ isn't interesting, interested in saving good folks, really because there aren't any of those. Like we said, even at our best, we are still sinners. We are all sinners, and that's who Jesus came to save. In our in-person worship services, we say a confession of sin. Every week we have a confession of sin, a time where we all pray together and repent of our sins. And it's not there to put us down, to pull us down, or to make us feel bad. In fact, it's there to make us feel good. In affirming that we are sinners, we find value in going to God every single week and acknowledging that we fall short, that we mess up, that we haven't gotten everything right. We acknowledge that even when uh, we're hoping to do what's right, we fall short of God's ultimate glory. And again, we do this to, uh, not to put ourselves down, but rather to be lifted up by God's power. Not our own power, but by God's power to be lifted up. Take that weight off of our shoulders. Like Paul, we seek out God's mercy so that we can be made new and be made into examples for others. Well, this week we are celebrating a dark anniversary. This week, we remember the tragedy of 9-11 that happened 21 years ago. Can we believe that it's been that long? Can you maybe remember where you were on that day? Here we are 21 years later, and we might ask, what has transpired in 21 years? Are we in a better place? Perhaps in some ways. Al-Qaeda, ISIS are no longer as powerful, but Afghanistan is now under Taliban control and domestic terrorism is on the rise. It seems in some ways we live in even more fear, fear of terrorism than we might have 21 years ago. But I offer one thing here. If we were readily willing to admit our own sinfulness when dealing with issues of war and terror in the world, how might we be different? What if we entered all of those conversations about war and terrorism, acknowledging that we fall short of God's will in our lives? There's no doubt that terrorism is evil, no doubt at all, and God will ju judge all appropriately. But what all sins have led to terrorism in our world, whether foreign or domestic? How have even peaceful places been guilty in creating an environment for terror? It's a very complicated question, but when we reflect on the last 21 years, we need to acknowledge our own sins and failings. I want to conclude by teaching a prayer. I want us all to say this prayer together. It's a good one, and a good one to say on a regular basis. It's often called the Jesus Prayer, and it goes like this. Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's it. Try saying that out loud. Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. This can bring such calm and peacefulness. I know it has for me to just repeat this prayer again and again. The good news is that Jesus didn't come to save the worthy. Jesus came to save sinners. And that's me, and that's you. But even in our best moments, we are guilty of sin. So let's give glory to our God, who loves us so much 
that even in our state of sin, he was willing to be here with us, to die for us, to bring us salvation. Amen.
As we reflect this week on the anniversary of September 11th, I want to invite you to join with me in prayer, to turn to God and to seek out God's abundant mercy and wisdom. So let's pray together. Dear God, we remember before you today those whose lives were lost in the catastrophic events of September 11th, 2001. And for all those whom we love but no longer see, we give thanks to you for the selfless courage of those brave souls who ran into burning buildings and who labored in the rubble. May their courage be to us a witness of what is possible when we are guided by love and dedication to our fellow human beings. We pray today for the continued healing of all those suffering emotional and physical scars. May our spirit breathe new breath into clouded lungs, new life into troubled minds, and new warmth into broken hearts so that all may feel wrapped in your loving embrace. May we move from suffering to hope, from brokenness to wholeness, from anxiety to courage, from a death to life, from fear to love, and from despair to hope. Guide our feet into the way of peace. Inspire with us, us with hope in the gift of shalom. May we receive this gift so that we might become instruments of your peace in this world, knowing all people as equally loved, lovingly created children of God. Amen. If you are here in the Los Angeles area, we want to invite you to join with us for in-person worship. We meet on Sundays at 10.30 a.m. right here on Ventura Boulevard in Tarzana, California, a very nice place to be. We have Sunday school for children and youth as well as community service opportunities for people of all ages. Our ministry is made possible through your donations. So if you'd like to support God's work at St. James, check out the link for online giving in the description below. Wherever you might be today, know that God is there with you. So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, go in peace and be blessed. Amen. <laughs>